Hey, welcome to Daylight Savings Time. Isn't it wonderful? Don't you just love that? Yes. Yeah, well, we have somebody that does. Very positive attitude in here. And you're wondering, Mark, why are you looking at us through a rear view mirror? Well, that is a kind of a strange thing, is it not? It is very odd. I agree. But what I realize is today we are teaching through the book of Psalms again. Psalm 95. Psalm 95, so grab your Bibles, your devices. Well, tell me why you're looking at us through a review mirror and what this has to do with Psalm 95, because that's what Psalm 95 is. It's a rear view mirror. Is that what you're going to tell us? No, actually what it is, it is a glance into the past. Last week, it was Psalm 90. Psalm 90 was called a prayer of Moses, a man of God. It was a psalm connected directly to that of the book of Exodus and the children of Israel and their exodus from Egyptian bondage. Well, Psalm 93 or 95, well, it's the same thing. It takes us again back to Exodus and back to the children of Israel. But here's what Psalm 95 is. It's a look back at mistakes and to make sure that you and I don't make them like other people has made them. You know what? There's an old saying it says that hindsight is 2020. You remember, you've heard that before, right? Hindsight is 2020. And sometimes we think in our life, well, I'm living here in the now. And you know, if if I if I if I know or since I know some mistakes that people had made well in the past, right? Then I wouldn't make them now. And so that's exactly what Psalm 95 is. It is sort of a visit to the past for you and I so that we do not make the mistakes of those that came out of Egypt in the Exodus. And so here is the amazing part about this, that this psalm is written to those that are, and, and I saw this parallel, so powerful, those that are, that are rescued from bondage, those that are taking a trip with God, and simply how they view God's character throughout their journey. That's our journey. It's the same journey, so it's so applicable. It's, it's an application for you and I this morning that we learn from their mistakes, we minimize ours, because I know that this is not a perfect group of people. Can I say it? Can I get an amen on that one? Oh, you're not convinced, are you? Yeah, it's daylight savings time. Why? Yeah, you don't have to be convinced right now. So let me read the psalm to you. It's 11 verses, very short. Read it to you in its entirety. And here we go, Psalm 95, verse one. Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with Songs of praise for the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. I underline that because we're going to start in a moment by talking about, well, how we view God, how we view God, a good holistic view of God in his hands are the depths of the earth and the heights of the mountains are his also. The sea is his for he made it and his hands formed the dry land. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the God, Lord, our maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you hear his voice. Oh, it's important that we listen to this. Do not hearken in your hearts as at Meribah. By the word Meribah, you write the word testing, because that's what it means. As at the day of Massah, write the word Massah, then you're going to write the word quarreling. And I realize that that none of you ever quarrel, or this is not, you know, this doesn't apply to you. It applies to those who are in first service, right? Yes. So we'll we'll just kind of read through it in a moment in the wilderness. When your fathers put me to the test and put me to the proof, though they had seen my works, for 40 years I loathed that generation and said, they are a people who go astray in their hearts and they have not known my ways. Therefore, I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. So last week, Psalm 90, and today, Psalm 95, both are referenced to the book of Exodus, but both written to people that are in exile in Babylon. Let me give you a little background again, if you haven't been here, that these Psalms in book three and four are written to those who have been taken captive and taken back to Babylon as slaves. And so what has happened is this that the Babylonian king came into Jerusalem. He kidnaps the king of Israel, which is a direct descendant of David and is the visible sign of God's presence in Israel. So it's as if God has been what? Kidnapped to them. 
Then they destroy the temple, they destroy the palace of David, and they take most everybody that's in Jerusalem and they take them captive and they march them back to Babylon. And so what the psalmist does, he takes us back to a point in history, that rearview mirror gaze to direct those that are in exile at this point to help them in this process of their life so they will not make the same mistakes in their exile in Babylon that those did in their exodus from Egypt. You say, Mark, there's a lot of E words in there, isn't it? Yeah, I know there is, exile and exodus. And I practiced it a lot to try not to mix them up. I really did. So I, I'm, hopefully I can do that well this morning. But what I wrote in my journal as I begin to read this is this, that if God is showing us this backward glance so that we don't make mistakes, the same mistakes that others made behind us, then God is a God of opportunity. So write that somewhere in your Bible or in your notes or wherever, that God is a God of opportunity because some of you need an opportunity in the room. Some of you need another opportunity in life. And so God is a God of opportunity. But when I look at this, what I realize that those that were coming out of Egypt in the Exodus that their mistakes had a result to that. And we just read it in the text that their, the result of their, well, the way they saw God was that their hearts were hardened toward God. So here it is. What is a hardened heart? I think we need to answer that. What is a hardened heart? And how do I know if my heart is being hardened? And I think it's a valid question if we're gonna talk about that today. Because in context of Psalm 95, a hardened heart is a heart that continually denies the character of God, continually distrusts God in light of what God has done for them. I think you need to understand that. It's a heart that continually, and I use that word intentionally, continually denies the character of God and distrusts God in light of what God has done. So in context of what we're talking about in Psalm 95, it's simply this, it's being a witness to God, parting the Red Sea, and then continually distrusting God for a bottle of drinking water while you're in the desert. That's exactly what it is. It's simply looking at God and saying, oh, I watched you part the Red Sea, but I can't trust you for a drink of water while I'm in the desert. That is what a hardened heart is. But when you read Psalm 95, it talks a lot about worship. So there has to be some connection between worship and the hardening of my heart. You say, Mark, so does that mean if I worship, my heart gets hard? So I'm not going to sing anymore when it comes to Sunday morning. You know, I'm not going to do that. No, no, that's not what it's saying at all. I word this intentionally like this because I wanted you to think for a moment. Because what I realize is that worship is more than an event. Worship is more than the holy hour in the south. You know what that is, right? What is the holy hour in the south? It's between 11 and 12 on every Sunday morning. That's the holy hour in the ta- south. So it's more than that. It's more than a song. It's more than a sermon. It's more than a moment. So if you stick in your feet in the sand on the beach this summer, ooh, isn't it a great day to talk about the beach right now? Isn't it? Yes, yes. You thought that you woke up to living in Alaska this morning, didn't you? I know, yes. And you stick your feet in the sand and the warm breeze hits you in the face and you look at the vastness of the ocean and you realize how amazing God is. It's a moment of worship. It's even more than that. It's all of that, but more. Here's what worship is. It's a personal declaration. And I wrote personal intentionally. It's a personal declaration of God's character and nature, regardless of what's happening around me. It's a personal declaration of God's character and nature, regardless of what's happening around me. Then what I realize that worship does not always change my circumstances. We talked about that last week about prayer, but what I understand is worship does, church worship does change how I experience those circumstances. So let me go back to the text. Let's unpack it together for a moment. And let's talk about Psalm 95, verse one. Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord, the psalmist said. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with his songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. I underline verse three. 
In his hands are the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountains are his also. The sea is his. And I underline this part, for he made it and his hands formed the dry land. Come to, come and worship. Each one of these statements starts with come and worship, come and worship the creator. And I added the word king, not on the screen, but I added the word king, creator, king. Here's what I read in this text, that God is the sovereign ruler and he is the creator of the universe. The point is that he is not just the creator and he's not just the ruler. It's how you see God today. It's this holistic view of God. It's how we see God's work in our life. We see God's work as a holistic work with all of our lives. Listen, God just sent Jesus to, to die on the cross for the, just the forgiveness of our sin, but yet there's more to the work of the gospel in our life than that, not devaluing that at all, but it's a holistic view in what God does within our lives. And so we see God in the same way, that God is king and God is creator. I wrote this week in my journal. He is maker and he is owner. Wow, I had to view him that way. If I'm gonna have those moments of worship when things around me are not worshipful, right? Then I have to view God in this holistic point and, and how he really is, that God is that of both maker and owner of my life. Well, here's the point, okay? Because if I just see him, if I just see God as maker alone, then we talked about the difference between deist and theist last week. Then I am a deist if I see him as maker or creator alone. Because what I see him is that God is that of the celestial watchmaker and he makes the watch, he puts it on our wrist and he says, listen, you go figure it out on your own from now. And we'd see God like that. And so God leaves us up to our own resources. But if we see him as just that of owner, king, then we view him as a monarch who rules over us just because of his pedigree, because of his position in life. So we become subjects only and we obey him out of obligation only. So I have to see him as both the maker and the owner of my life. And I think the children of Israel during the Exodus and that of during exile and you and I as God's children, we still struggle to see God in the light of who he really is. Because if we don't see him in this holistic view, then it's very difficult for you and I to declare his character regardless of the circumstances around us. Because the way I see God is this. He gave us life and he intervenes in our life. I think it's important. That he gave us life and he intervenes in our life. That God is actively involved within our daily lives and every moment of our life. And knowing that enables me understanding that God made me for his glory and he made me. So I realize that. So understanding that makes me realize that, that God's intentions toward me are good, that God loves me. God, God is for me and not against me. When I realize that God simply owns me, what I understand is this, that God intervenes in the every moment of my life and that gives me this holistic view of God. So in those moments when life is not good, I still declare God's goodness. Wow. It's a lot to chew on. It really is. It's a lot to kind of digest for us today. This holistic view of who God is, that he is maker and owner of our lives. Go to verse six. It helps us a little more to understand all of this. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God. We are his, we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. And I have a greater understanding of verse seven in knowing who God is today if you hear my voice. So he's saying, listen to this. So the second thought is this, to come and worship the God of covenant. Beside the word covenant, write the word promise that he's a God of promise, that he's the good shepherd. And so what that means is this, that when he takes you and I as sheep and he puts us in the pen, right? That there's an opening for us to enter and to exit through, that he's the one that always sleeps across the entrance of the pen so that when the wolf or when the predator comes for us, they have to get through the good shepherd, but the good shepherd is always faithful to his sheep. Plus, if you and I want to stray 
And we know that all sheep stray at some point. You do. Don't look at me like you never have because you have, right? You know you have. This is church. You can't lie here, right? So you have to get through the good shepherd because the good shepherd is faithful. Wow. That he is maker and owner and God is faithful. He's faithful in so many areas, this holistic view of God that he doesn't just save us from our sins. He brings us into community that we are people of his pasture. His redemptive work renews every aspect of my life, spiritual and communal and environmental and emotional. He's faithful in every area of my life. So I look at this and I realize that this psalm is written to those in exile about those that were in an exodus. And he's saying, these are the things that you should see that they did wrong. And he starts out by simply saying, it's how they saw me. So how do you see God today? That's a huge question. How do you see him? What's your image of him this morning? Is he just that of the maker or is he just that of the owner or have you embraced a holistic understanding of who God is in your life? So it brings us to verse eight because we have to know that to understand the rest of these verses. Verse eight says, do not harden your hearts as in Meribah, a place of testing, as in the day of Massah, a place of quarreling in the wilderness. Can I tell you what those are real quick before we go on? I think it's important for you to understand for context. It simply takes us back to Exodus chapter 17. It is where, it is where after the Red Sea parting, it is this moment where they find themselves in the desert and they're thirsty. They are thirsty. And so they are quickly forgetting what God has done. And they say to God there in the book of Exodus, they simply ask him a question. Have you brought us out in out here into the desert to let us die? It's that moment. In view of what God has already done, it's that moment in their life. Verse nine says, and when your fathers put me to the test and put me to the proof, though they had seen my work, He's talking about the miracles, the plagues, the parting of the Red Sea, the other miracles. For 40 years, I loathed that generation and said, they are a people who go astray in their heart and they have not known my ways. So here's the next thought. Come and worship. It's, I added the word it's because it helps you to understand. It's the antidote of a hardened heart. It's the antidote of a hardened heart. I declare God's character regardless of what goes on around me. It's that's the antidote to a hardened heart is what it is. This is that rear view mirror in, that Psalm 95 gets us, gives us about the mistakes that we see from those children of Israel and the exodus out of Egypt. And so what the psalmist does, he's going to give us four practical things that we can look at our life. And if they apply with God's help, we can fix this. Because as I thought about this and you look at those things, if you have the notes this morning, you say, Mark, I know these things. I know about obeying the voice of God. And I know about not hardening my heart or maintaining into relationship with God or knowing God's way. I know those. I know. So did the children of Israel. But yet they still, they still harden their hearts toward God. So I asked the question, how does physical thirst and how does moments of uncomfortableness cause you to have spiritual amnesia? How's that happen? Man, how do you look in a review mirror, you know, and you see all these, you see all these amazing things, right, that God has done. How does that happen? And then shortly after, you forget all of that and it, you accuse God of being unfaithful. Well, here's things that you can do for your heart not to be hardened. The first is this, obey the voice of God. To obey the voice of God It's not enough just to hear. This is a lesson about hearing and obeying. That's important because that's where we start because this is not a debate about whether God speaks or whether God doesn't speak. God speaks to us. He does. 
I loved what Tally said this morning. She said that she felt God speak to her. She felt God impress in her spirit. So God does speak and she responded. And that encourages us so greatly as followers of Christ as well. But this is where we have to start. God does speak. So what do you do? How are you responding when God speaks to you? That's a question. How are you responding? So in thinking about this, I have to read from the book of James because here's the book of James and here's what it says about this topic in James 1 and 22. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. I stop for a point. Self-deception is the worst deception of all. You know why? Because you think you're okay. You think it's okay for you to come in here on a Sunday morning and sit and hear me talk in a very loud tone for 40 minutes or so, and then that's good, right? You're all good, checked off that box, and everything is great. But James says, wait a minute, you are deceiving yourself. He says in verse 23, for if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. I had to stop and make a comment for a moment. So I've thought about the mirror kind of thing. And and when I begin to read what I realize, oh, I found a great fact for you. You want to hear a fact? It's great. If you're ever on Jeopardy, it's perfect. Okay. Here's the fact that on average, on average, women look at themselves in a mirror 16 times a day. Did you know that? Isn't that great? Men look at themselves in a mirror 23 times a day. <laughs> Doesn't that confirm to all the women what you've always thought? Doesn't that? Yes, 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 it does. Absolutely. Interesting. I thought that was interesting. Not really uh, contextual to what we're talking about, but I thought it was interesting, you know, really. I did. Uh, but I did read up on a mirror and I thought, well, did they do a the time of James? They have mirrors. I mean, I don't know. I don't know. Not mirrors like you and I have. What they had was a piece of metal that was highly polished so they could see the image of themselves. And that image in that highly polished piece of steel would be, well, it would be somewhat blurred and skewed, you know, as it, in fact, it would leave very little impression. So this is the analogy that James uses because it leaves very little impression upon them, then it's easy to walk away from. It's a thought. In fact, the word is used forget in here, but the better word in translation for the word forget is to discard. And so what James is saying to us is this, that you can come into a place like this, or, or you can read scripture, or you can pray, and God speaks to you, And you get up, and it's not that you necessarily forget what has been said to you, but because you don't allow it to have that impression that it should have upon your life, you discard it intentionally, and then you deceive yourself in thinking that you're okay. Mark, we were doing good with the facts about how many times we look in the mirror, and now you bring this up, right? Yes, because this is hard. So remember, each pew today is equipped with seatbelts. Put them on, right? You have to buckle yourself in on this because this talks about where we are this morning. He said, hey, look in the rearview mirror. You know, if you don't want to make the mistake of those people back there coming out of Egypt, if you don't, listen, then, then look at what they did. And this is exactly what they did. And don't make that mistake yourself. They heard God's voice, but then they didn't respond to the voice of God. They didn't obey. Verse 25, but the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets or discards, but a one, a doer who acts, he will be blessed in doing so. How do you do that? You have this holistic view of God and you understand that God is for you, not against you, that God is your maker and God is your owner and God is the shepherd, that he is your provider. So you step out sometimes in faith when God speaks to you because you know that God never sets you up for failure and God is always about what is good for you in your life. Wow. Let's pray and go home. That's enough, right? No, there are more. There are more of them. 
because God knows you. Can I say before we go on, this is not about perfection. This is about progress in your life. The second thing he says, don't harden your hearts. He talks about two places, that of Massah and that of Meribah. And those two places are about quarreling and testing. Wow. I could ask questions to you this morning. How many of you have ever tested God? And then some of you would probably not tell the truth. Or how many of you have ever quarreled with God? It's true. Am I saying that you cannot ever question God? That's not the point about this text. It's about this continual questioning, this continual doubting and denial of God in the very face of all the things that God has done in your life. And all of a sudden you begin to create God in your own image. And you say, I'm going to create an image of an unfaithful God. That image encapsulates your heart and it hardens your heart. And the next step that you make with a hardened heart is rebellion against God. It's exactly what they did in the book of Exodus. It's exactly what the psalmist is trying to tell those in exile in Babylon not to do. Think about the times you've rebelled. Mark, I don't want to talk about that this morning. I know. Think about it. Think about all the moments in your life that you have rebelled against God. The process that it took to get you there. And the process it takes is you remaking God in your image. You encapsulate your heart. Your heart becomes hardened. And when your heart becomes hardened, then you rebel against God. So this is about having the right attitude toward him. So what is the right attitude toward God? Three things in the middle of this about not hardening your heart. Worship, declaring his character regardless of your circumstances. It's simply worshiping. It's it's declaring those truths where you are in your life right now, not where you wish you were. That's worship. Trust that you surrender him to him as both being maker and owner of your, of your life. It's about obedience, the third. It's about obedience, that your response to God's word and voice in your life is a response in love because you know his character and nature and you don't forget the things that God says to you. Don't discard them because you know that God's intentions toward you are always good. The third, maintain an intimate relationship with God. This is it. Remain in, maintain an intimate relationship with God. He says in here, they go astray in their hearts. Why? Because before we ever sin with our hands and our mouth or our, our feet or whatever, that sin always takes place where? This is a quiz. This is a, in, our, in where? our mind and our hearts. That's where it starts. That's why he says to them specifically, they go astray in their hearts. This is the process that happens. It's that failure in our spiritual life begins there. It's the brokenness of our intimate relationship with God. That's where it begins. It's like my relationship with my wife, Reba. It's like that relationship with her. If it were to fail because of my mistake, then then what happens? That mistake took place long before in my heart, before it ever took place in my hands or my mouth or my feet. It begins there. That's where we have to start before it ever manifests itself in an outward form. It starts with our heart, regardless of where you're trying to place the blame and your, your reaction to something or whatever. It always takes place in your heart. You have to deal with that. Oh. Can somebody say amen for a moment? Oh, that's good. That's wonderful. It's true. It is so true. Fourth is this, the last one, know God's ways. Know God's ways. Have you ever questioned God's intent for your life? Mm. So, you know, the person sitting next to you, maybe you, you came with them this morning, right? And, and I don't know. And, and hey, maybe you had like a big argument in a car on the way here, right? And, and this is a great time to, to make up, isn't it? Isn't it an awesome opportunity? But I want you to ask them this question. 
And, and this is, I know, is very personal, but just, just ask them this question for me. Have you ever questioned God's intent for your life? Turn to them and ask them that for a moment. Listen to how quiet it is in here. Isn't that strange? See, this was, a, this was like an experiment. Some of you are still talking because you're just letting it all out, aren't you? Like, man... <laughs> I've been waiting for this moment. I just got to unload, off, you know, and that's wonderful. I'm glad you're doing that. It's hard, it's hard isn't it? Truth is hard. I don't, I don't, I don't want to admit, does that, does that make me some oddity, you know? That, no, that makes you actually, you know what it does? It makes you human, right? It really does. It makes you human that we have done that in our lives, and we question God's intent for our, our lives at times. I wrote in my journal this week when I put that question down. Mark, have you, ever, have you ever questioned God's intent for your life? And I put a big yes, right? I have a big yes. And I kind of explained it a little bit. And, and then, then I put after that, always strive to have an answer for yourself. For those of you that talk to yourself a lot, this is real easy, right? But, did, but yet always strive to have an answer for yourself by knowing his ways. By knowing his ways. So what if last week we talked about these moments when you find yourself in a tough spot in life and you always want God to rescue you? That was like chapter uh, Psalm 90. And, and so you want God to rescue you. And, and, we, and we said to you, what if the point of you being there is for understanding? Remember that? I don't know if you were here, but what if the point was for understanding that where does God do his greatest work in our life? It is always rescuing us from that moment in our life or perhaps leaving us there for a little while. So the point is that we have a greater understanding of his character and nature. So in the middle of a bad time in our life in the future, that we can declare God's goodness and we can declare God's nature and character even when life is not good. Do you think that the ability to worship God in those moments of your life like what psalmist is telling us in Psalm 95, just happens naturally within our lives? No, it does not. It is a process to get there. And that's what he's saying to us, that this is the process. Know my ways. Know my ways. That he is maker and owner, faithful God. Know my ways. Verse 11. Verse 11 is where we go home. So I want to read it to you. And then it says this, Therefore, I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Here's, here's a real interesting thing about Psalm 95. There's no end to it. It's, it's left open-ended. Interesting enough, there's a reason behind it's left open-ended. It's left open-ended so you and I write the ending with our life. We write this with our very life is what it says. He just didn't fill in all the blanks for us that simply this is the process of our life. And so we write this with our very life. So come and worship, entering into God's rest is what he's saying. That you can't continually deny the character of God and there not be some residual effect in your life. You can't do that. To continually deny the character and the nature of God has an effect upon your life. It does. So I found this text in the book of Hebrews chapter three, which brings it to a very New Testament-ish approach for you and I. Because Hebrews chapter three, starting at verse seven, is, is almost a quote of Psalm 95, a direct reflect, reflection of Exodus 17. Therefore, as the Spirit says, in other words, today, it says, listen today to what the Spirit says. If you hear his voice, do not hearken, harden your hearts as in the rebellion. It's talking about the Exodus. On the day of testing in the wilderness, it can't even be more plainer than that. Where your fathers put me to the test saw my works for 40 years. Therefore, I was provoked with that generation and said, because you can't, this is not the scripture, but this is me adding a little commentary. You can't continually deny the character and nature of God and it not have some effect on you. 
Therefore, I was provoked with that generation and said, they always go astray in their hearts. We've talked about this. They have not known my ways. As I swore in my wrath, they should not enter my rest. 300 years of bondage plus Moses shows up. He leads them out of Egypt after the plagues. The Egyptian army follows him to the Red Sea. Maybe you know the story, maybe you don't. And their back is to the Red Sea and the army approaches and God performs a miracle and opens the sea. They cross on dry land. The Egyptians say, this is a great idea, let's follow. And they are all killed. The Israelites find themselves at the promised land. a home that God promises them, a place of rest. That's why he talks about rest. So God says, hey, come to the river's edge and look what I prepared for you. He says it's a land flowing with milk and honey, a land of security, a land of prosperity, provision, a land of rest. So what did they do? They sent 12 spies over to check things out, right? Two spies return. Hey, this place is amazing. Pack your bags. Let's move in. Ten spies come back. Hey, hang on. Don't pack your bags so quick, right? Because those people over there are really tall. Yeah. And I wrote this week in my notes, so that's their excuse. Those people are really tall. It's like God would say, hey, do you guys remember the Egyptians? Do you remember the the Red Sea? Do you guys remember the plagues? And they would say back to God, but God, like all the Egyptians, they're kind of short people. They're like five, seven. These guys are like six, seven, God, and you can't handle six footers. They're pretty tall. What does God say? Okay, fine. No rest for you. Like the soup Nazi, right? No rest for you, yeah. Yeah, if you don't know what that is, look it up. (laughs) Seinfeld people. Just wander in the desert for the next 40 years. Wow. God is so mean, right? Hey, look at their wandering. What does God do? God puts a cloud over them every day for shade, right? And at night when it's cold in the desert, he puts a pillar of fire to keep them warm. What does God do? God shows up every morning with manna biscuits. He does, just for them. He causes rocks in the middle of a dry desert to gush forth water. Yet their hearts are hardened. God says, come and rest in me. And they say, no. And they grumble and they complain. They say things like, God hates us. Paraphrasing, so God has brought us out here to die is what's happened. And what I realized this week, if I take this story and I'm looking through the rearview mirror, right? And I take this story and I lay it over my life and your life the edges really match up. They really match up. So that's why he said in verse seven of Hebrews three, therefore, as the Holy Spirit says today, if you hear my voice. So today, if God asks you this before we pray, if God asks you, hey, you need to walk away from this in your life. What are you gonna do? If God asks you, you need to get help with your situation in life, what are you going to do? If God says, let's walk this out together, how are you going to respond? Maybe God's been saying to you, hey, let's get help. You need that. Maybe God said, you can't fix this. You tried, you tried to work this out. And man, you just made a miserable mess of an already mess in your life. And then he says, come in and sit down. Find rest for your soul. Have you come 
to the end of yourself. Why 40 years in the desert? Because God waits for a generation to pass. So they have to come to the end of themselves. That God, I see you as maker and owner. And I see you as faithful. God, I hear your voice. And because of the way I see you, I'll respond because I know that you have the best intentions for my life. But before you get there, you have to come to the end of yourself. Perhaps the greatest lesson taught to those in Babylonian exile is that point. So where are you? Where are you in this journey? And I know it's an eclectic group, so we have so many journeys going on. But I know that for some of you, this is the moment where you come to the end of yourself. And you see God for who he is. You hear his voice, and because you know who he is, you respond to him. And in those moments when life is not good, that you're able to stand in the middle of those moments of your life and declare that God is. So for a moment, whether you're in this room or joining us through church at home, would you take a moment to cut out distractions? And if if that's the posture of bowing your head and closing your eyes, then that's fine. If other ways, then that's understandable as well. I know that those of you who are joining us at home today, there's a lot of distractions there, maybe even more than here. So do your very best this morning and let's pray together. Father, you have assembled us this morning. In your providence, you have brought us together. It's not by chance. And God, you brought us here together because You wanted us to hear Psalm 95. Because this is a moment for us to take a glance in our rearview mirror so that we minimize the mistakes in our future. But God, before we begin that journey, may we embrace who you are as your children. That God, you are both maker and owner of our lives. And to see you in that holistic view, God, changes everything about our relationship. That God, that we see you faithful, that you're the good shepherd. You're the good shepherd, Lord. And through that lens, Lord, we look at these mistakes that our brothers and sisters coming out of Egypt made. And God, we take that and we lay that over our lives. God, when you speak to us, may we see you in the light of being that of maker and owner and faithful, knowing that to hear you and to obey you is the best thing for our lives. Father, for those in the room that continually doubt you, that those that continually, Lord, try to remake you in their image and thus they have encapsulated their hearts. Lord, by your power today, no heart is too hardened that you cannot break through that callousness that we have placed around our heart. So I pray today by the power of your Holy Spirit and your word that you pierce that today with truth. They see you for who you are. They hear your voice and obey. 
that we come to the river's edge this morning, Lord. We hear your invitation. And we step into your rest this morning. Even though it may be challenging, even though it even may be fearful at times, will push us out of our comfort zone in life. We step into your rest today, God. Because we have come to the end of ourselves. So do your work in our hearts and our lives this morning. In your name we pray.